here today to preach to you the everlasting gospel of Jesus Christ, who died for you on the cross, shedding his precious blood for you. The question today, today for volunteer state students is what are you doing with the shed blood of Jesus Christ? That's the question for you today. Are you trampling under the foot by going on in your sins and treating it as a common thing, as if his sacrifice does not matter? Or are you forsaking your sins, trusting in Jesus Christ, and walking in holiness? That's the question. You need to examine your life. Look at your own heart and your mind, what you're doing with the free will God's given you. What did you say? I don't even know what that means. Uh, but the Bible says you can know uh, if you are following Christ, you can know where you'll spend eternity by looking at your life, by examining yourself. And the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5 and verses 5 through 7, For this you know that no fornicator that's those having sex outside of marriage, that no fornicator, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. So if you're a fornicator, you're having sex with your boyfriend or girlfriend, if you're an unclean person, this is a general sinner, if you're an idolater, if you're a covetous, the Bible makes it clear you have no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. No inheritance. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Yeah, it says, let no one deceive you with empty words. If someone tells you, you can be a fornicator and have an inheritance in Christ's kingdom, those are empty words. According to the Bible, if you believe them, you're deceived. If you're having sex with your boyfriend or girlfriend, you don't love them, first of all. And second of all, you have no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. That's why the Bible says in Ephesians 5, Do not be partakers with them. Because such people have no inheritance in Christ's kingdom. You need to forsake your fornication. You forsake your drunkenness, whatever your sins may be, and trust in Jesus Christ and follow Him and obey Him. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10 says, Do not be deceived. I wonder why he said that. Because many people are deceived, and he knew many people would be deceived. The unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God will not. And then he gives a list of people who are unrighteous. Check to see if you're on the list. This is the list you don't want to be on. It's not the dean's list. It's God's hit list, so to speak. And it says, fornicators. Man, that sure doesn't seem to come up a lot. But guess what? We're in a college setting here. I know there's lots of fornicators on this campus. Fornicators are unrighteous in God's sight. And they will not inherit the kingdom of God. So it starts out with. We're going to talk about idolaters. An idolater is anyone who's worshiping or serving any God besides the God of the Bible. And when I say any God, I mean little g because there is no other gods. There's only one God, one true and living God, the God of the Bible. The God of Muhammad doesn't exist. He's a demon. The God of Mormonism, who was once a human on another planet, doesn't exist. The gods of Hinduism don't exist. In fact, Paul calls these other gods, these, these idols, he calls them demons. So if you're worshiping any god besides the god of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, besides the Father of Jesus Christ, then you worship another God, and you're an idolater according to the Scriptures. And when Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, 
No one comes to the Father but by me. He meant it. And with that one sweeping, intolerant, politically incorrect, narrow-minded statement, Jesus dismissed every other religion. With that one statement, Jesus essentially said, Hinduism is wrong. Mormonism is wrong. Islam is wrong. That's what Jesus is saying when he says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. He's the only way. He's the narrow way. He says, enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way it leads to destruction and many go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life and there are few who find it. The question you must ask yourself today, young people, <clears throat> are you among the many or are you among the few? If you're living just like the rest of the people in the world, you're living in sin, you're among the many. You've walked through the wide gate, you're currently on the broad way, and you're on the path to destruction. But you need to get off the broad path, off the broad way, and get on, go through the narrow gate of Jesus Christ and get on the difficult path of life. Because Jesus Christ is your only hope. Only Jesus shed his blood for you. <clears throat> only Jesus was wounded for your transgressions. Only Jesus was bruised for your iniquities. Only Jesus was chastised for your peace. And by his stripes can you be healed. Only Jesus Christ can help you. That's right, you mockers. Only Jesus Christ can help you. And you mock the gospel of Jesus to your own detriment, sinner. You mock it to your own detriment. You'll give account for every idle word the Bible says. <clears throat> You'll give an account for every idle word. By your word you shall be condemned, and by your word you shall be justified. So Jesus said, out of the mouth comes the overflow of the heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So when filthy things come out of your mouth, mockery comes out of your mouth, you show your heart that you're not right with God, that you're on your way to hell. So fornicators, idolaters, homosexuals, sodomites, are all in big trouble with God. God calls such people unrighteous. And he says they will not inherit the kingdom of God. It all talks about drunkards. If you're one of those people that's getting drunk on the weekends, or maybe you've gone so far that they get drunk during the week too, drinking your Bud Dumber and your Miller Low Life and your Milwaukee's Worst, just slurping it down, guzzling it down. Maybe do some keg stands. The Bible makes it clear, no drunkard shall inherit the kingdom of God. You need to become a former drunkard. You need to give up your drunkenness. Because drunkards are not received into Christ's kingdom. Drunkards will go to hell, the Bible says. The Bible says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. The Bible says, for what is your life? It's even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Some of you young people, you think you're invincible. You think you're going to live to be 75. You could die today. Yes, you could die today. And you smile and walk by. Most of you won't be smiling when you're on your deathbed. Most of you won't be smiling. You don't smile when you're at a, uh, a funeral for somebody. But you ought to think about death now. Because what comes after death is the final test, the final judgment. You know, just started the semester, but eventually you'll get to finals. 
you'll cram for your test and you'll study throughout the semester for your final test just to get that A or B or maybe you're even satisfied with a C. But there's something more important than the final exams. And you ought to cram for it. You ought to get up, open up the scriptures. You ought to read what it says. It tells you about God and His character. It tells you about yourself. It tells you about the past. It tells you about the future. It tells you how God's going to judge you according to His perfect and holy law. This is the most important textbook. More important than all the textbooks in this university combined. Because Jesus said, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of God endures forever. And Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never changes. Since his character never changes, he's going to judge you according to his character. He's going to judge you according to his law, which is a revelation of his character. And so you ought to prepare yourself. You ought to make yourself ready. Because for most people, when Christ returns, he'll come as a thief in the night for most people. The only people who he won't come as a thief in the night for are those who are ready, those who are watching, those who are praying, those who are looking for the signs he talks about in Matthew 24 and in Revelation. So Christ, for sinners, will come as a thief in the night. And he's going to come and stomp out the grapes of wrath, the Bible says. Is that your Jesus? Or is your Jesus still in the, the manger and the nativity scene around Christmas time? He's still the little cute little baby in the manger. Well, Jesus grew up. He performed many miracles and signs and wonders. He taught the truth. And then he laid his life down to the hands of a lawless man who beat him and bruised him and crucified him. Even though he could have called on 12 legions of angels if he wanted to. But he was beaten and bruised and crucified. He was dead. He was buried. He rose from the grave on the third day, defeating sin and death. And now he commands all men everywhere to repent because there's coming a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. Yet Christ is not going to return, friends, as a suffering servant. He won't allow the wicked to touch him this time. He won't have to call on 12 legions of angels. The Bible says the sword that comes out of his mouth, the words that come out of his mouth, the sword of the Spirit, will destroy his enemies. And if you're an enemy of God, friends, you're in big trouble. And you want to know how you're an enemy of God or not? James 4 tells us, it's adulterers and adulteresses. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever, therefore, is a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. So there you go. If you're a friend of the world, if you love the things of the world, then you're an enemy of God, the Bible says. 1 John 2 says this, Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of this world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. So who is it that abides forever? The one who does the will of God. Those who love the world, lust of the flesh, Oh, I gotta have sex and pornography and beer. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, ooh, that immodest girl walking by. The, uh, the, the pride of life, yeah, we won the championship. Oh, we're gonna win the Super Bowl this year. All those things are gonna pass away. They're not gonna remain. God's gonna judge people for such things. You ought to give up those things, let go of them, and cling to Christ instead. 1 Timothy 2 Starting verse 3 says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. 
And I'm here to testify of him, the one who gave himself a ransom for you, that you might be delivered from your sins, that you might walk in holiness, that you might have forgiveness of your past sins, and be cleansed and pardoned before God. Galatians 1, 4 said, The Lord Jesus Christ gave himself up for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age, according to the will of my God and Father. Christ shed his blood to deliver you from the lust of the flesh, to deliver you from the lust of the eyes, to deliver you from the pride of life. You may think that your sin is so great and so, so big that God could never forgive you and never accept you, but God is willing to cleanse. God is willing to forgive. God is willing to reconcile you back to himself through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. And Christ's sacrifice is sufficient to forgive every sin. Christ's sacrifice is sufficient to cleanse you of all sin and to empower you to walk in holiness. But Christ's sacrifice, the benefits of his sacrifice, the forgiveness he offers, is only available to those who forsake their sins. It's like this in Isaiah 55. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and then he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. See, there's mercy and abundant pardon available that where sin abounds, grace abounds it all the more. It's available for those who forsake and give up. Jesus said it like this in John 5, 14. Go and sin no more. And that should be the heart the mindset of any Christian. That they're surrendering all their sin. See, you don't come to Christ, friends, and give up some of your sin, but hold on to some of it. He doesn't accept you like that. You don't come and get engaged to someone and marry them and bring just one of your other girlfriends with you or one of your other boyfriends and give up five of them. You think someone's going to want to marry you? You think a, a man's going to want to marry you if you give up five boyfriends but keep one for yourself? He wants it all. He wants faithfulness. And the Bible describes the church as the bride of Christ. And Christ will only marry at that great wedding feast when he returns those who have given up all their spiritual adultery, have given up all their fornication, all their drunkenness, all their lust, all their lying and stealing. Only those will have a part in Christ's kingdom. And that's part of the problem. Most people want at least a little bit of sin in their life. They want to hold on to it. They want to have their cake and eat it too. They want Jesus to be their Savior, but they want to stay in their sins. But John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He wants to take it away from you. But so many of you hold on to it so tightly. You like your fornication. You like your drunkenness. You like your drug using. You like your lying and stealing. You like your covetousness and your sports idolatry, whatever your sins may be. But Christ is commanding you to give it up. He says, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter turn to mourning, your joy to gloom. Humble yourself in the sight of God and he will lift you up. See, when I was a drunkard and a fornicator, I laughed about it. I was partying, laughing hard, but my laughter had to be turned to gloom. I have to become humble before God. And many of you aren't willing to humble yourself. You aren't willing to see yourself in truth. You aren't willing to look in the mirror of God's law and say, yeah, I've, I've fornicated, I've gotten drunk, I've, got, I've lied, I'm a liar, a drunker, and a fornicator. You're not willing to do that. You're not willing to realize that you're a hell-deserving sinner. You must realize that. That's the first step in having forgiveness of sins. That's the first step. And, uh, and having eternal life is realizing that for your sins, which are great in the sight of God, great in the sight of God, you deserve hellfire. That's God's punishment for the wicked. Hellfire. But God is offering you what you don't deserve. But you must give up your sin. You can't have your sin and have the Savior. You can't look at pornography and have Jesus as your Lord. You can't have sex with your boyfriend or girlfriend and think you're okay with God. 
can't tell those little white lies and half truths and fibs and be okay with God. You can't be a homosexual and be a Christian at the same time. You have to give up those things. Only those that give up all their sin can have eternal life. That's God's conditions. Repent or perish, Jesus said in Luke 13, 3 and 5. Repent or perish. And God's calling you today to repent. He's giving you an ultimatum today. Repent or perish. The Bible says, For God to love the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We've heard, you know, most of you probably know that verse. Even if you weren't raised in church. But you just gloss over it, most of you, like it's no big deal. Do you realize that God gave His only Son for you? That you've been an enemy of God through your sins, through your wicked works, but God still sent His Son to die for you? I mean, how many of you who have children here today would give up your child, your only child, for one of your enemies in order for them to be saved? And we're talking about people who blaspheme your name and cuss and curse your name every day. You know, I, I preach at college campuses, sporting events, concerts. As I preach to these places, I hear people walk by and take God's name in vain. It's no big deal to them. And I see, a, as a finite human being, I get a small glimpse into what God sees. He, I, I get to see a few people walk by who blaspheme His name. Best people go into LP Field, or whatever stadium it is, 70,000 people in that stadium. Every time there's a bad call, they blaspheme God's name. God deals with us day in and day out. People sinning against Him, you're just one person. There's 7 billion people in the world. And most of them sin against Him every single day. And God, God deals with it. And God still offers them mercy. Still offers them His Son. And they reject, 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 and go on in their sin. Most people. And you today, God is patient with you. He's long-suffering with you. He's kind towards you. But don't despise the riches of His goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God, His patience with you, should lead you not to keep on sinning. It should lead you to repentance. But in accord with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Who are under each man according to his deeds. Okay, is that cutting my head off, son? Is that cutting my head off? Look in the camera, son. You can see my head like up here. So God's patience with you, His long-suffering towards you, should not cause you to keep on being fornicators. should not cause you to keep on being drunkards and liars. should not cause you to keep on being porn watchers and homosexuals. The patience of God towards you, as a sinner, should cause you to repent. It should cause you to give up your sins. But many of you, you treat the patience of God... As if it doesn't matter to you. But well, someday, for each one of us, the patience and long-suffering of God will run out. It will run out, friends. And on that day, God will give you what you deserve. On that day, if you hadn't repented of your sin, that means forsake them and trust in Christ, God will give you justice. For God is a just God. God's not just loving. God's not just good. He's just and He's wrath. And as you go on in your sin and reject the gospel of Jesus, you store up wrath for yourself. Because God isn't pleased with the wicked. God isn't friends with the wicked. The wicked are God's enemies. Psalm 7:11 says God is angry with the wicked every day. 
not happy with the wicked. He's angry with the wicked every day. And if you're a wicked, that includes you. But the good news is that Christ died for the ungodly. That's what it says in Romans 5, 6. And at just the right time, we were still without strength. Christ died for the ungodly. You don't, you don't realize the magnitude of that. I mean, imagine one of our soldiers in America jumping in front of a bullet that was intended for Saddam Hussein. Or jumping in front of a, bu a bullet that was intended for Osama bin Laden. You know that that was love because not stepping in front of a bullet for his, 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 someone who's on his side. He's stepping in front of a bullet for an enemy. And that's what Christ did. You need to realize if you're a sinner, if you're a fornicator and a drunkard and a potty mouth, or a homosexual or a sodomite, or a porn watcher or a liar or a thief, you're an enemy of God. You're not God's friend. But you can have peace with God through the blood of Jesus Christ, through his sacrifice on the cross. He offers it to you, takes no delight in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn and live. God doesn't want the drunkard to die a drunkard and go to hell. God doesn't want the fornicator to die as a fornicator and go to hell. God wants fornicators to become former fornicators. God wants drunkards to become former drunkards. That's what I did. Christ changed me. I submitted myself to God. I humbled myself. I cried out to God. I sought Him while He may be found, and He changed me. I became a new creature in Christ. That's what 2 Corinthians 5.17 says. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. All the old things have passed away. Behold, all has become new. When someone becomes a Christian, they become what the Bible calls born again. And Jesus said, except the man be born again, he will not inherit the kingdom of God. He will not inherit the kingdom of God. You know, I travel from campus to campus preaching. I find there's lots of lies going around college campuses. It's like a factory of lies being perpetrated. And one of the biggest lies in the college university scene, in the college university culture, is this lie called safe sex. People think, well, if I just put a condom on, I'm having sex safely. You're deluded. You think that. You really are delusional. You don't know the facts if you think that putting a condom on means you're having safe sex. Not true. First of all, there's lots of STDs that a condom does not protect from. AIDS is one of them. The AIDS virus passes right through a condom. So there's no such thing as safe sex. You know, the worst STD a foreigner cater can get is one that will stay with them even after the grave. It's the one that has no cure after the grave or even before the grave. No human cure for it. And every fornicator, every time they fornicate, gets this STD. Every single one, every single time. It's not crabs. Not herpes, not syphilis, not HIV, it's not gonorrhea. This STD is called sexually transmitted damnation. And every fornicator, every time they fornicate, incurs upon themselves more damnation. And no condom, no human elixir can prevent or protect a fornicator from this STD. And the more you go on in your fornication, the more you heap upon yourself sexually transmitted damnation. Because God is not pleased with the wicked. And fornicators have no inheritance in Christ's kingdom. The only cure 
the sexually transmitted damnation for the fornicator is the blood of Jesus Christ shed on the cross. And the only way a person with this disease can be cured of it is by forsaking their sins, giving them up, trusting in Christ and what He did for them on the cross, and begin to walk a life of holiness and obedience. That is your only hope. If you've fornicated, if you've had sex outside of marriage, you have this STD, whether you know it or not. And the only cure is to stop your fornication along with the rest of your sins and trust in Christ. And God promises to cleanse you of your sins and to forgive you of your sins. But when Christ promises to cleanse you and forgive you of your sins, He only forgives you of your past sins. So if you were to sin again, you have to repent again. And as many people will say, well, I sin every day, in thought, word, and deed. Well, then you're not a Christian. You're a hypocrite. Christians don't sin every day in thought, word, and deed. Christians obey God. Christians live holy. There's no such thing as a Christian fornicator. No such thing as a Christian drunkard or a Christian potty mouth. Christians obey God. Jesus said in John 14, 15, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now how many actually keep his commandments? Very few. I've met a couple at this university who keep his commandments, but it's few and far between, considering the population of this whole campus. It's few and far between. But I'm here today to preach to you the gospel of Jesus Christ, in order to compel you to give up your sins. And you ought to have the fear of God in your heart and mind, because that will cause you to give up your sins. Proverbs 16, 6 says, In mercy and truth, atonement is provided for iniquity, and by the fear of God, one departs from evil. You ought to fear God. It's the beginning of wisdom, according to the Bible. But so many of you, you come to school and you come as like a, uh, a neo-atheist or a neo-gnostic, agnostic, and you think, well, I'm going to come to school and if I can find proof for God or evidence for God, then I'll fear Him. He got it all backwards. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. If you don't fear God, you have no wisdom at all. You have no knowledge at all. That's why the Bible says in Psalm 14, 1, the fool shall say in his heart, there is no God. That's what agnostics and atheists are. They're fools. That's God's word. But God has taken the, the foolish things according to the world to shame the wise. And many people who hear the gospel preached, they think it's foolishness. But the Bible says the preaching of the gospel is foolishness to those who are perishing. So if you think that preaching the gospel is foolishness, then it's a sure sign that you're perishing. 1 Corinthians 1.18 For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved is the power of God. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer, the debater of this age? Has, God, has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? He has. The wisdom of this world is foolishness. All those fools like Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens, the former atheist, Sam Harris, all these people are fools to say God doesn't exist and to try to promote that idea to other people, especially to young people. But God does exist, and God will judge your life. He's going to judge you in righteousness. He's not only going to judge your actions, he's going to judge your thoughts and your words. Every idle word you're going to account for. Every thought, the things done in secret that no one else knows about, God will bring into judgment. That's what the Bible says about God. All the lustful thoughts which God sees as adultery, all the poor and watching, which maybe no one else knows about besides you and God, 
God's going to judge you for those things. All the selfish motivation, all the selfishness, God is going to judge you for these things. All you men who look at women who are dressed immodestly, you, you watch them as they walk by and lust after parts of their body, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. You're in trouble. Whether you want to believe it or not, you're in trouble. Lustful people are adulterers in God's sight. In the Old Testament, adulterers were stoned to death. Adulterers are in trouble. And being stoned to death is nothing compared to being cast into hell. Where the worm does not die. And the fire is never quenched. You'll be there forever and ever. Every fornicator, every drunkard, every liar who refuses to give up their sin and follow Jesus Christ and obey Him. That's what will become of you. That's not God's will for you. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. So he gave himself a ransom for you, to d deliver you. And God wants all to be saved, for all to come to a knowledge of the truth. And that's good and acceptable before God. That all would be saved. That all would come to knowledge of the truth. That all would be saved. That's what God wants. And Christ is the only mediator between God and man. A mediator is someone who comes in between two parties that have a dispute. God has a dispute with you, sinners. You're his enemy. The only one that can solve this dispute between you and God is Jesus Christ. And you reject this mediator for most of you. You reject his mediation. You reject his offer of peace between you and God. And I'm not talking about a feeling of peace, but actual peace between you and God. Where you, you surrender and sign the treaty. You surrender all to him and sign the treaty and say, Yes, I'll do whatever you want me to do from here on out. That's what happens in a peace treaty. When you're an enemy who's going to lose the battle no matter what. There's no hope for the sinner outside of Christ. There's no hope for eternal life for the fornicator and the drunkard outside of Christ. But let's go back to these lies that are perpetrated on college campuses. We talked about the safe sex lie. That no sex that incurs upon you the wrath of God is safe sex. Because no matter how many STDs or unwanted pregnancies you protect yourself from by wearing a condom, you incur upon yourself the wrath of God when you have fornication. That's not safe sex. That's the most unsafe sex you can have. Sex that will cost you your soul. Sex that will send you to hell. The only safe sex is between one man and one woman in a monogamous marital relationship. That's the only safe sex. That's the only sex that doesn't incur the wrath of God. Okay, thanks. That's the only sex that doesn't incur the wrath of God upon you. So that's the first lie. And many of you believe this lie. You'll keep on using con and think you're having sex with your girlfriend or boyfriend safely. You're not. You're deluded. Not a lie going around college campuses is this lie that you can't judge. Because the Bible never says, never being come close to saying such a thing, or that only God can judge. The Bible does say that only God will send people to hell. That the white throne judgment is done by God. But the Bible also says in 1 Corinthians 2.15, the spiritual man judges all things. 
and he himself is rightly judged by no man. See, a spiritual man can judge. That's a Christian man, a man who's living for God. In Matthew 7, 1 through 5, doesn't say you can't judge. It says you shouldn't judge hypocritically. You have a plank in your eye. You shouldn't be trying to take a speck out of someone else's eye. Matthew 7, 1 through 5 says. But this lie going around college campus that you can't judge people is ridiculous. To even say such a thing is to make a judgment. You can't judge me while you're judging my judging. Of course you are. And in doing so, you're being a hypocrite because you're saying you can't judge, but you're judging. Yeah, you're a hypocrite. Because you just judge my judging. Hypocrite. God commands you to repent. Give up your worldly philosophy, your worldly ideals, and submit your mind to the mind of God in the Scriptures, where God's mind is revealed in the Scriptures. He tells you what He thinks, tells you what He's like, He tells you how He's going to judge, tells you about you, what you should do, and what will happen if you don't do it. This old lie of you can't judge is nonsense. Try to find a criminal in a courthouse and try to find someone who will tell you you can't judge them. I go preach at a Nashville courthouse sometimes, and that's one lie I never hear there. You can't judge me. I never hear it there. They just came out of getting judged. They know better. Many of you have this, this weak backbone here in America. Many of you do. You can't judge me. Yeah, I can. God commands me to judge. And God commands me, above all, to warn you of His judgment. And if you have a problem with my judgment, you're going to have a great problem with God's judgment. Because His judgment is more severe, more strong than mine is. I can't cast you into hell, but God will. God will cast sinners into hell. I have no power to do that. But I will warn you, as long as I have breath, I will warn you of the wrath to come and tell you to flee it to Jesus Christ. Flee the wrath, flee to Jesus who died for you on the cross. So the two lies we see going around college campuses, this, this safe sex lie and this you can't judge me lie. Then there's this lie of the greatest sin in the world is intolerance goes around a lot on college campuses. The greatest sin in the world is intolerance. It's ironic because I find the people who have that excuse, who have that objection, they're intolerant to me. And I found the world is tolerant to everything except for biblical Christianity. No surprise there. The world didn't love Jesus. Jesus said of himself in John 7, 7, the whole world hates me. I testify of it that its works are evil. They crucified Jesus. They weren't tolerant of him. So if you're a Christian, why expect the world to be tolerant of you? But this nonsense idea of intolerance, accept me as I am, just accept everybody, that's the greatest love there is, and intolerance is the greatest sin there is, what a bunch of nonsense. Everybody's intolerant of something. Hopefully everybody here is intolerant of rapists. Hopefully everybody here is intolerant of child molesters. Hopefully everybody here is intolerant of murderers. You should be intolerant of liars. You should be intolerant of thieves. Some of you would tolerate thieves unless it was your stuff being stolen. Then you wouldn't tolerate them. Some of you tolerate lying as long as you're the one doing it. But someone lies to you, you don't tolerate it anymore. You get upset about it. Everybody's intolerant of something. Everybody. But God is intolerant of sin. And if you have sin in your life, God is intolerant towards you. Nope. No, I used to be. Used to be a drunkard and a fornicator and a potty mouth and a porn watcher. 
But I forsook those things. Now I follow and obey Jesus. What do you think of the military? What do you mean, what do I think of the military? Oh, I don't think that. You're deluded if you think that. When did God tell you to go in the military, young man? You're in the military? Oh, so was I. That was in the army. Fort Bragg. I figured you'd say something like that. That's okay. But the fact of the matter is, uh, military, whether it's Marines, or Army, or Navy, or Air Force, they don't do God's work. They do the government's work. They sign their life away, not to even protect freedoms. I mean, when was the last war that was fought anywhere in the world, and America was involved, that had to do with protecting America's freedoms? Uh, that wasn't protecting America. When, who in Afghanistan is coming against our freedoms? Uh, and did we fight Al Qaeda or did we go to Iraq instead? Uh huh. Well, I wouldn't consider that really a war. I consider that maybe a hunt down, try to find Osama bin Laden who might have been behind 9 11. Who said they wanted to be liberated? Really? Then why are they still fighting against American soldiers now? What's that? I think it's not my business to take another person's life. That's what I think. It's not my business to take someone else's life. It's not my business to play God. That's what I think. No, I'm not. I'm preaching you God's Word. I'm a messenger of God. But taking someone else's life it's playing God. You have no right to take someone else's life. No one does. I'd rather be brainwashed in the Word of God than brain dirty in the philosophy of this world. Yes, I am brainwashed in the Word of God. Every day, I wash my mind in the Word of God. This is the only truth. It comes from God. So you can keep your worldly wisdom if you want. And be brain dirtied if you want. And I'll be washed in the Word of God. Yes, many of you have dirty brains. Dirty with lust, dirty with pornography, dirty with selfishness, dirty with all those filthy musical lyrics you listen to in your ears. All that TV you watch, those filthy shows you watch. It's filled with violence. Oh, I could sin. I have free will. I'm tempted every single day. But I choose not to. Where does the Bible say that? doesn't say it. A, a baby is born innocent. They're not born a sinner. A sin is a choice. Sin is a choice to do good or evil when tempted to do evil. That's what sin is. The New King James. But none of the Bible is talking about someone being born a sinner. Never, that would actually have to change the definition of sin. So a baby has not done any good or evil. A baby is innocent in God's sight. If we're born sinners, where do babies who die go, according to you? They'd have to go to hell. What's that? The baby was born when? No. That baby's not a sin. What that person did was a sin. That person's a sinner. The baby's not a sinner. And the baby isn't a sin. Every child that's ever been created, God knitted them together in their mother's womb. God was involved in the process. God can take someone's sin and make good come out of it. That's what a baby is. People fornicate. Woman gets pregnant. Something good comes out of it. Unfortunately, people don't treat babies as good most times. There's an inconvenience. They go kill them instead. Have an abortion. 3,000 every day. You're pumping your fist for killing a baby? You're a hypocrite. The only reason you can say that is because you weren't aboard, you hypocrite. Yeah, it is messed up that you want to kill babies. That's really messed up. The only one that can't defend themselves, can't say anything in their own defense, and you pump your fist to kill them under the guise of population control. What a filthy sinner you are. Yes, you are filthy. You think it's okay to kill babies. Disgusting. Wake up, man. Come out of your sleep. 
your spiritual slumber. Open your eyes. You think it's okay to kill babies and you cheer for it? How far have you gone, young man, to think it's okay to kill innocent babies and you pump your fist for it? Do you realize the whole population of the world can fit in Jacksonville, Florida? You don't, you don't need any population control. You ever flown across the United States and looked outside the plane? You ever looked outside the plane when you've flown across the United States? There's plenty of empty land. We don't need any population control. Maybe you're the one that should be controlled because you want to kill babies. Maybe you, you're the one that should be exterminated because you want to kill innocent little babies who have no choice. Disgusting. Proverbs chapter 6. Verse 16. These six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood. That's you. That's you. Hands that shed innocent blood. The Lord hates them. It's an abomination to him. Hands that shed innocent blood. Babies are innocent, and you want to shed their blood. You cheer for it. You pump your fist for it. Like it's a touchdown being scored or something. A heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift and running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies. These are the things God hates. And you love the things and pump your fist and cheer for the things that God hates. You're a polar opposite of God. You have your father the devil. And you need to repent, young man, before it's too late for you. You're probably pretty close to being a reprobate. You think it's okay to kill babies. You're pretty close to having no hope left. You think it's okay to kill babies. How hard harder do you have to be? Do you even realize what happens to them when they're killed? Vacuum their brains out. Yeah, after they crack their skull with some scissors, they vacuum their brains out because their head is too big to fit out of, out of the woman's uh, opening. Uh-huh. And you think it's okay if it's earlier on. What a hypocrite. Uh, actually, it's still going on. I know this for a fact. Yes, I know it for a fact. Late-term abortions are still happening. I know that for a fact. Blows my mind. You know, murders have no eternal life abiding in them. Murders don't know God. That's what America is, is full of murders, have the blood of babies all over their hands. Everyone that cheers for it, yay, kill babies, population control. Everyone that cheers for it has the blood of babies on their hands. You know, God commands us to stand up for those who can't stand up for themselves. To help the widows and the orphans. And you know, the ironic thing is, the amount of babies that are aborted every year, is almost exactly the same number of people who are waiting to adopt every year. Isn't that amazing? Almost the exact same number. People would just adopt them. They didn't pay to adopt them. And people would rather pay to kill their baby. An abomination in God's sight. And people, people will sing, God bless America. No, no God, not God bless America. America's not in a position to be blessed by God. America's in a position to be damned by God, but not be blessed by God. I sure am. And America is in a position to be damned by God. I fear for this nation. You know, in, in, the, in the Old Testament, when a nation was under the judgment of God, it happened in many different ways. It happened with uh, sicknesses and diseases. It happened with famines. It happened with natural disasters. It happened financially. And finally, it happened with a foreign invader coming in and taking it over. We've been through almost all of those already. And America still doesn't wake up. 9-11 happens, let's go back to life as normal, no big deal. Let's go fight them over in Afghanistan, but they'll be okay again. It's only the mercy of God that we've been able to sustain America for so long. Not because of the Army or Navy or Marines or Air Force. The mercy of God. 
And God's mercy is running out for America. And God's mercy may be running out for you individually. If you don't repent, you must repent. You must give up all your sins, whether your sin is lying or stealing or lust or it's porn watching or it's drunkenness or fornication or drug use or a potty mouth or a wicked heart or pumping your fist for babies being killed. Whatever your sin may be, God has commanded you to give it up, to surrender your life to Him. And He's willing to cleanse you. He's willing to forgive you. No matter how great your sin may be, no matter how much your sin may be, God is willing and able to cleanse you and forgive you. Christ shed His blood for you on the cross. He died the just for the unjust to bring sinners back to God, to reconcile sinners back to God. He takes no delight in death of the wicked, but rather that they turn and live. But if the wicked don't turn and live, He'll give the wicked what they deserve, which is hellfire forever. I know that's what I deserve for my past sins. I know I deserve hell for my past sins. And each one of you need to come to that realization. But you don't need to stop there. You go beyond that. If you've humbled yourself in the sight of God, you need to seek the Lord. Seek repentance. Seek forgiveness from Him, and He'll grant it to you. Not because you're a good person, but because He is good. Not because you're good, but because He's good, He's willing to forgive you. He's willing to cleanse you. It's what He did, sending His Son to die on the cross. We don't deserve that. None of us deserve that. None of us deserve Christ's sacrifice on the cross. Christ could have called on 12 legions of angels, He said in John, when they were resting in Gethsemane. He could have called on the angels, but He, he submitted Himself to God's will. Because of His love for you and for me, and His care for you and for me, He's willing to shed His blood for you that you might have forgiveness of sins. But many of you, you treat the, the cross of Christ and His shed blood as if it's no big deal. Maybe you've heard it when you're growing up in the church and you, just, you heard it you're blue in the face and you got tired of hearing and you became apathetic towards it. No big deal. Yeah, Christ died on the cross. We'll talk about it at Easter time and that'll be it. But the Bible said if you treat Christ's sacrifice as a common thing, you're guilty of trampling His blood under your feet. It wasn't a common thing. It's a supernatural thing. It was an uncommon thing for Christ to shed His blood for sinners. Christ shed His blood for His enemies. That's what I was. That's what you are. If you're still a sinner, you're His enemy. You talk about going to Afghanistan and being Marine. If someone's your enemy, they're in trouble, aren't they? If you got them in your sights, they're in trouble. Well, sinners are in God's sight. There's no escaping His sight. You're right, it'd be a lot worse than a machine gun. A machine gun, you die. You're done with it in a matter of minutes. God's hell never runs out. It never ends. We also don't damn die. I mean, if it was that hard to get to heaven, and if it was really bad, physical, there would be no angels. Angels have never sinned. The ones that did sin one time got kicked out of heaven. They're going to hell. You were a sinner. I was a sinner, yes. I didn't say I was an angel. I'm a human being made in God's image. Christ died on the cross for humans, not for angels. As a human being, if you don't go and sin no more like Jesus said, if you don't repent, you're going to perish. If you don't forsake your sins, you're going to go to hell. So humans aren't angels? No. Of course not. I don't know where you got that from. Hebrews 4.13 and there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Everything is open, friends. Your thought life. Think about your thought life for a second. This was the last week, last month, last year. Put it on a DVD and let your grandmother watch it. You'd run out of the room in shame. But you'll stand before the holy God of the universe... See, all your thoughts to the beginning, to the end. And many of you continue on your lustful thoughts, your perverted thoughts, your selfish thoughts, not caring that you're going to give an account to God, not caring that He's going to punish the wicked. God doesn't have Santa Claus in heaven. You come and sit in His lap and tell Him what you want, and He gives it to you. He's the Holy God. 
And He commands you to repent. He demands you repent. It's appointed a man wants to die, and after this comes the judgment. You know, you young people here probably, no one here more than 21 years old. That'd be my guess. 24? Okay. Anyone older than that? You know, 24 year olds die all the time. You ever read the obituaries? Teenagers die all the time. You, if well, you were a Marine, would you ever go to the Middle East? So you, you, you sat in the shadow of death, basically. Yeah, it should have caused you to seek God. You're all, you're all sitting there in the shadow of the trees right there. It's comfortable, it's nice, not being in the sun, right? But the Bible says you're sitting in the shadow of death. And that means the tree's nearby if you're in the shadow. Death is nearby. Did you get that? Young man, it's going to grab a hold of you and drag you into the grave, into eternity when you least expect it. When you least expect it. Not many people get that deathbed experience. They can sit on their bed for a couple months and think about what's going to happen after they die. You may only have today. Your life's a vapor, the Bible says. It appears for a little time and vanishes away. What are you going to do if you're a vapor, your life vanishes away today? The Bible says you ought to walk carefully, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time for the days are evil. The Bible says you ought to walk carefully, redeeming the time. You ought to walk carefully, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, for the days are evil. But so many of you, you don't walk carefully. You walk flippantly. You don't redeem the time. You waste, the t waste your time. You waste your time on things like Facebook and YouTube and your iPhone. You waste your time watching filthy movies and listening to filthy music. You waste your time fornicating your boyfriend and girlfriend and getting drunk on the weekends. Many of you waste your time idolizing sports stars and athletes. And the Bible says you're a fool. Because your life may be demanded of you tonight. And if you're not ready to meet God, Judgment Day will be a terrible day for you. Terrible day. I'll read Hebrews 4.13 again. You need to get this truth in your head and live in light of it. And there is no creature hidden from his sight that all things are naked and open to the eyes of Him to whom we must give an account. Naked and open to all to Him to whom we must give an account. No sin is secret to God. Your porn watching in your dorm room at night is not a secret to God. You smile about it, but it's your damnation. It's your condemnation. You're porn watching. You're lost. It's your condemnation. If you laugh about something that'll cost you your soul, I pity you. I pity you. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The wages of sin is death. And when the Bible says in Romans 6, 23, that the wages of sin is death, it's not talking about physical death, young people. It's talking about the second death, which Revelation 20 describes as being cast into the lake of fire. That's what it says. Revelation chapter 20. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is called the Book of Life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which are written in the books. 
the sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is a second death. And anyone not written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. If your name isn't written in the Lamb's book of life, you'll be cast in the lake of fire on that day. And only way to have your name written in the Lamb's book of life is to forsake your sins. The only way to escape the judgment of God is through the cross of Christ. You really only have two options. You can stay a sinner and get what you deserve for your sins, or you can forsake your sins, trust in Christ, and get what you don't deserve for your sins. This is grace and mercy. And forgiveness. So Christ is will God is willing to receive Christ's sacrifice. He's pleased with it. He's willing to allow that to be the substitute for you going to hell forever. That's what God's willing to do. And the Bible says in 2 Timothy 2.19, the solid foundation of God stands, having this seal. God knows who are His. And let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. If you want to name the name of Christ... You have to depart from iniquity. Give it up. Put it aside. The Bible says, draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter turn to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself in the sight of God. He will lift you up. Some of you, the things you laugh about, God absolutely hates. He despises the things that some of you laugh about. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 9 says that Christ loved righteousness but hated lawlessness. Some of the comedy movies you watch, God absolutely despises. He hates them. You ever heard of Chris Farley? He was a comedian from my generation. He's in hell right now. That's not my opinion. That's absolute fact. I have God's word upon it. Yes. Oh, says who? Where does God say that? Where does it say that in the Bible? It doesn't say it. I'm telling you. Uh -huh. It doesn't say it. Yeah, he runs away because he has nothing to say. He has no answer for it. He has no answer for it. You know why he's walking away? Because his idol, his idol Chris Farley is in hell and he realizes it now. I don't talk to Chris Farley. I don't talk to the dead. I talk to God. He tells me to preach the gospel. You want to know what God says? Open up the Bible and read it. Man, you really have your history wrong. You really don't know what you're talking about, young man. Where did you get that from, young man? Says who? What history book does it say that the Bible was written in 435 A.D.? Give me a book, a history book, that says the Bible was written in 435 A.D. I want to see it. I want to, I want to see this history book, young man. They said the Bible, the Bible was written. Go get it. Go get it. Go get it. The book doesn't exist. There is not one book. Not one book that says the Bible was written in 435 A.D. But even if there was, it'd be wrong. That's right. No, it isn't. It doesn't align with history, young man. Doesn't align with history. Oh, well, I'm going to keep on reasoning with them, disputing like the Bible tells me to do. Well, it's worth it to me.
It's worth it to me. It's worth it to me. Maybe not to you, but it's worth it to me. The Bible was written in the first century by apostles and their companions, and the claim of the Bible about itself is this, that it was written by holy men inspired by God. That is its claim about itself. It was inspired by God. The word inspired means God breathed it out. Who's a murderer? Uh huh. <laughs> and that should that that makes his testimony even more powerful. That he was killing Christians and became one and suffered with them. That's even more powerful testimony. Even more powerful testimony. That he's a former murderer who became a Christian and he was tortured for his Christian faith. That's more and more powerful testimony. Oh, he repented of his murder. And he never actually murdered anybody. He persecuted the church of Christ. You're not a holy man. You're disqualified. You're a sinner. You're disqualified. He's a sinner right now. He's currently a sinner. He's disqualified from about anything from God. God doesn't even listen to sinners, the Bible says. God does not even listen to sinners. God doesn't even listen to sinners. Isaiah 59 and verse 1. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so they will not hear. You remain in your sins. You treasure your sins. God does not even hear your prayers, the Bible says. The first prayer God hears from a sinner is when a sinner is broken in their heart, contrite in their heart, repenting of their sins and trusting in Christ. That's the first prayer God hears from a sinner. Psalm 51, 17 says, The sacrifice of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. The Bible says in James 4 that God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God resists. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. As long as you're proud and lifted up in your heart and mind, God opposes you. God is against you. But the moment you humble yourself and become broken and contrite over your sins, that is the moment that God will hear your prayers. You know, humble yourself as a drunkard and a fornicator and a potty mouth and say, I don't want to do this anymore, God. I forsake this. I want to live for you and obey you. Hey, Malcolm. Okay. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody has sinned. Not everybody is sinning now. I'm not sinning. I gave up my sin. Um, I don't have any sin thoughts in my head, young man. Maybe you do. You know what I think the problem is? You love your sin so much, and you do it so much, you couldn't imagine life without it. You couldn't imagine life without it. I have a life without it. I love God. I keep His commandments. And I did say thank you to her. Thank you very much. <laughs> say it a little louder, young man. I can't hear you. Don't be cowardly. You serve a, co a country? 
So you sign a concert to kill people for your country that makes you not cowardly? I used to be in the military, young man. But I'm against killing people, yes, just like God is. I'm against killing people. But, but signing a contract and saying, I'm going to kill people for this country does not make you not cowardly. I'm shaking in my boots, young man. Shaking in my boots. It's a phrase, young man. You know it. I'm not scared of you. I'm not scared of you, young man. I, I, don't, I fear God. I don't fear man. I fear God. Uh, where does the Bible say that? No, it doesn't say that. Yes, praise the Lord. Maybe he'll end up like me instead of like you, a filthy sinner. Yes, I hope he ends up like me. I hope he ends up like me. Because I follow Christ. I want to be just like Christ. Yes. You act like you're insulting me. That's, a, that's good. I want him to be like me. He wants to be like me. Doesn't want to be like you. Doesn't want to kill people for a job. I'm talking to the young man over here. No, I'm not talking to you with your filthy language. Oh, well, why don't you come over I here and say that to me then? Look, I absolutely, I'm a Christian myself. I got free okay? I am completely, I don't want God. Why are you smoking then? Standing here in front of us saying... If you love God, why are you smoking? I am not a sinner. That is a sin in my spirit. If you love God, well, if, if that's a sin, then I'm okay in your book, right? What's the big deal? If you think we sin every day, what's the big deal if I'm sinning, right? How would you know that? Do you know everybody? Do you know everybody? That's right. Do you know everybody? Do you know everybody? Then how do you know everybody sins? Where does it say everybody sins every day? Where does the Bible say that? It doesn't say it. That's right. It says the filthy mouth hypocrite. The filthy mouth smoking hypocrite wants to tell me that I'm a sinner. No, I'm not. You know why you want me? You know why you want me to be a sinner? So you can justify your sin. Well, I'm not going to help you out. I'm not going to help you out. You didn't give up your own sin. Give up your filthy mouth. Give up your cigarette. Give up all of your sin and actually follow Christ. Obey Him. He said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. If you're not keeping God's commandments, you don't love God. 1 John 3, 18 through 19 says, My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, that's that young lady, but in deed and in truth. And by this we know we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. That's the Bible. 1 John 2, 3 through 4. Now by this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. She who says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments, is a liar. And the truth is not in him or her. Yes, if you love God, if you really know God, you'll keep his commandments. First Corinthians 2, 15. Okay. Okay, Matthew 7 and verse 1. Matthew 7 and verse 1. Which the young man in do-rag, uh, the hat right there, just quoted. Matthew 7 and verse 1. What is, the, what is the punishment for someone who judges? They'll be judged the same way they are judging. I have no problem being judged the same way I'm judging. I don't do the thing I'm condemning. I don't do the things that I'm against. I'm not a drunkard, I'm not a fornicator, I'm not a liar and a thief, I'm not looking at pornography, I live holy. So Matthew 7, 1 is fine with me, I have no problem with it. But Matthew 7, 1 through 5, read the whole context, it's talking about hypocritical judgment. Those who have a plank in their eye, but try to get a speck out of their brother's eye. That's a sinner. I took the plank in my eye a long time ago. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, it's referring to matters here on earth. And it goes on to say in 1 Corinthians 6, the saints will judge the world. Yes, I'm a saint of God, I'm going to judge the world. You can't judge the world, the Bible says you should judge. 
1 Corinthians chapter 6. The saints will judge the world. You can't judge because you're not God. You don't get it, do you, sinner? You don't get it, do you? The saints, the saints will judge the world. That's God's word, sinner. You may not like it, but it's the truth. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 2. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Tell me again, I can't judge. 1 Corinthians 2.15 The spiritual man judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no man. Tell me again, I can't judge. John 7.24 Wow, you're so authoritative. You're giving me lots of Bible verses, aren't you? John 7.24 John 7, 24, do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. The words of Jesus. Telling other people to judge. It's John chapter 8 and verse 7. I hear these lies all the time. I have. No, the way you're interpreting it, sinner. John chapter 8. In John chapter 8, you have a woman caught in adultery. And in the Jewish law, a woman is stoned to death for adultery. Okay? So, so when Jesus said to the hypocrites who had stones in their hands, literal stones, not word stones, not metaphorical stones, literal stones in their hand, to kill physically the adulterous woman, he said to those hypocrites, he without sin cast the first stone. So let's apply it to this situation. I have no stones in my hand. I have no desire for adulterers or adulterers and adulterers to be stoned to death. And and I had something in the past, but currently I'm not a sinner. None of it never applies to me. None of that applies to me. You know why? You know why you don't like judging? Because you're a criminal in God's eyes. That's why you don't like it. The, the reason you don't like judging is the same reason a criminal will never find a cop. Yes. The same reason you don't like judging is the same reason criminals don't go find cops. You're guilty. You're guilty. Sir, you do a good enough job of that by yourself. I don't have to help you with that. Then keep on going. No one makes you stand there, young man. Walk the class. Get a book. Continue learning. If I'm just spewing ignorance, then stop being ignorant and walk away. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going anywhere. You think, you think the books of this university give you knowledge and wisdom. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Sure did. I got a bachelor's degree. What for? Well, how do you know what I learned in school? No, I, I learned about the Bible in school. Yeah, so I got wisdom. It actually worked something. But those of you who are paying forty, fifty thousand dollars for your degree, I, I'm, I'm going to tell you a fact here. Most of you probably won't even use your degree. It'll become, it'll become an expensive piece of artwork on your wall. But you won't even use it. No, I use my degree. I use my degree. I use my degree, but, but most people don't even use a degree. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, 
and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block, and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than the weakness, and, and God is stronger than men. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world, to put the shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put the shame the things that are mighty and the base things of the world and the things that are despised God has chosen and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. Yes. So God cho chose the foolish things, the weak things of the world to put the shame the wise. And all of you are lifted up in your heart and mind, thinking, I'm wise, I'm smart, I know everything, I'm in college. I know more than you do, preacher. You're prideful. And God is going to bring your wisdom low. But the wisdom of God trumps the wisdom of the world every day, every time. In fact, the Bible says, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge is found in Christ. In Christ. That's Colossians chapter 3 or 2. What's that? Speak up. Don't be a coward. Right, I'm talking to him. I wasn't talking to you. Not going to speak up for yourself, young man? What'd you say then? Yeah, you did. Now you're lying. What'd you say, young man? I am perfect in Christ. That's the whole point of preaching the gospel. Colossians 1, 27, it says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ. That's the whole point of the gospel preaching. That you give up your sin and follow God and obey Him. Yes. That's good you want to admit that, but you're, you're being prideful about your admittance. You ought to admit you're a sinner deserving of hell. I know I still deserve hell, even though I, I'm walking in holiness now. I deserve hell for my past sins. That's my son. He wants to be here. And I want him to be here. It might be. Nope. Nice try, sinner. I do it to please God. Uh, pride, pride goes before the destruction. Pride goes before the destruction, you filthy mouth sinner. Pride goes before the destruction. And you're lifted up in your heart and mind. You're in big trouble. The Bible says, out of the mouth comes the overflow of the heart. Your, health, your heart's a filthy heart. You need a new heart. Christ is willing to cleanse your heart and make you a new creature. But as long as filthy words are coming out of your mouth, a sure sign your heart isn't right before God. That's what Jesus said. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. If you have filthy words coming out of your mouth, blasphemy, taking God's name in vain, cuss words, it's a sure sign you're not right with God. You're in trouble with God. But God is patient with you, long-suffering towards you, wanting you to come to repentance. This is good and acceptable in the sight of our God and Savior who desires for all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Christ gave himself as a ransom for all of you to deliver you from your sins to forgive you of your sins, to cleanse you of your sins, to reconcile you back to God. You too. Yes.
He's already reconciled me back to God. But if you're a sinner, you're not reconciled to God. God is willing to reconcile you to Him. But you need to become a former drunkard, a former pot smoker, a former fornicator, a former uh, potty mouth. Former sinners. God will change you if you submit your life to Him. If you humble yourself and submit your life to Him. Become broken in your heart about your sin. Seek God. The Bible says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way. And the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. That's God's word to you. Many of you are here, you're looking for your purpose in life. What your occupation is going to be. What you're going to do for life. You want to know your purpose in life? Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 13 through 14. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is man's all. You want to know your purpose? You want to know your all? Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. Most of you here, you want to get a degree so you can get a good job, have a family, buy a nice house, buy a car, retire, have grandchildren, and then what happens? You die. What are you going to do then? Are you planning for that? You're planning for a job. You're planning for a family, maybe. You're planning for retirement eventually. But are you planning for death? Are you planning for what happened after that? Because you're going to spend eternity somewhere, friends. You're going to spend eternity in hell or in Christ's kingdom. And what will determine... Which place you'll go is what you do with this man named Jesus Christ. The Bible says, For God so loved the world, and He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send us in the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. That's your part there, the might part. Might be saved. It's your choice. He that believes in Him is not condemned. He who does not believe... Is condemned already. He's not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. We ple I plead with you, friends, get right with God. Stop being fornicators and drunkards and potty mouths. Humble yourself before God. Submit yourself to Him. Surrender your life to Him. Wave the white flag of surrender and follow Him. He's the only one worthy of your life. Only one worthy of your obedience, your affections, your adorations. Many of you have idols in your life. You worship musicians and actors and actresses. You worship teams, sports teams, and athletes. You lift up these people and these things in your heart, money. But the Bible said you can't have two masters. You either love the one and hate the other, be loyal to the one and despise the other. You can't serve both God and mammon or God and riches. You can't serve both God and fornication. You can't serve both God and your boyfriend or girlfriend. Many of you work the bodies of other people. All you think about is lust. You watch pornography day and night. You're fornicating. Having sex outside of marriage. And you're serving other people. But the Bible says you ought to worship and serve the Creator. And you should have no idols before Him. But many of you are worshiping and serving the creature rather than the Creator who is forever blessed. Amen. Many of you worship people and things. All your time, all your money, all your energy, your affection, your adoration, every moment you're awake goes towards things and people. When it ought to go towards God. Instead of going horizontal, it ought to go vertical. You're not made for such things. You're not made for sin. You're made for righteousness. You're made in God's image. And many of you have just tarnished His image over and over again by going on in your sin. I'm here to compel you to live up to the image you were created in. To give up your sin, whatever, I don't know you, but whatever your sin may be, to give it up. And follow Jesus Christ, who gave himself up for your sins, that he might deliver you from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father. I'm here to compel you today to give up your sin, whatever it takes. You know, Jesus said, if your eye causes you to sin, all you lustful porn watchers, your eyes cause you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it's better to enter into life with one eye to go to hell with both your eyes. If your hand calls you sin, all you drunkards, 
hand calls you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. It's better to go enter into life with one hand than go to hell with both your hands. All of you walking to your boyfriend and girlfriend's house to fornicate with them, if your foot calls you to sin, cut it off to you to sin. It's better to enter into life with one foot than go to hell with both your feet. Now, Jesus is not endorsing mutilation, but he's simply saying, take drastic measures. Do whatever it takes to get the sin out of your life. Many of you are looking forward to having this nice job with lots of money to store up your treasures on earth. But the Bible says, do not lay up your treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal. Bruh, store up your treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Many of you, your treasures on earth, that's where your heart is. Your earthly mind, your carnally mind, your fleshly mind. But God commands you to be heavenly minded. Take captive every thought to the obedience of Jesus Christ. You're tempted to sin? No, I'm not going to do it. Instead of giving into it. That's God's will for you. That's a good and acceptable thing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved, all to come to knowledge of the truth. No matter how many wicked things you've done, God is willing for you to be saved. Is willing for you to come to knowledge that He wants you to be saved and forgiven. But you've got to take action. On the day of Pentecost, the people asked Peter, what must you do to be saved? He said, save yourself from this wicked and perverse generation. I say it to you. This world is going to get worse and worse and more and more wicked. A young man earlier today was pumping his fist for babies being killed. That's how far America has gone. That's how wicked America has become. Where good becomes evil and evil becomes good. We approve of things like homosexuality and abortion and drunkenness. There's a thing going around in America now where women are walking around topless in different cities. And no one's doing anything about it. Why do you have clothes on now then? Why'd you put a diaper on? That's sad. The only thing that holds you back in late is getting arrested. You have no respect for your own body, no respect for other people's eyes, no respect for who you might cause a stumble. Everyone wears clothes. Even babies wear clothes. They wear diapers. They wear onesies. They wear all kinds of clothes. You're usually born with no hair, too. Why do you have hair on your head? Go ahead. I mean, you were born that way. I'm just taking your logic to the logical conclusion. If you think you should be the way you're born, maybe you should stop having hair on your head. I bet right after you're born, you put a diaper on. You're still wearing diapers? I mean, come on. Let's think a little clearer here. You're not supposed to be the way you're born. You're supposed to grow up. God is not pleased with someone staying the way they're born. He wants you to grow up. No, you didn't even crawl or sit up, stand up when you were born. I guess you shouldn't be sitting up then either. You should lay down. You couldn't walk when you were born. Why are you walking? I mean, come on. You should be the way you're being when you're born. Why are you walking? Why are you talking? You couldn't talk when you were born either. You shouldn't be talking right now. No, I don't believe in that philosophy. She's the one that believes in that, not me. I don't believe you should be the way you are when you were born. I think you should wear clothes. I think you should wear clothes. I think you should walk around. I think you should talk to people. Yes. I know what you're saying. What comes out of your mouth. And I'm taking your logic to the logical conclusion. You're using being naked, the reason why you should be able to be naked the way you were when you were born. I'm saying, well, then according to you, if that's right, you shouldn't be walking, you shouldn't be talking, you shouldn't be sitting up. You should be wearing diapers still. You should be sucking your thumb. What other things babies do? But you don't do those things anymore because you know you shouldn't be doing them. And, and therefore, you also know you should be wearing clothes. God commands you to wear clothes. God is the definer of right and wrong. God is the determiner of right and wrong. You're not qualified. I'm not qualified to determine right and wrong. Only God's qualified. And God says you should cover yourself. God's a godly woman will dress modestly. 1 Timothy 2. What's that? What about him? What's your question about him? 
I wouldn't say necessarily. <laughs> yeah, I would say that uh, there's lots of people who've put in tattoos on their bodies for wrong reasons. Like when I was in the military, there's many times I wanted to go get a tattoo. I wanted to put a uh, tattoo on my chest, the Chinese word saying uh, insane or something like that. I can't remember what it was. But I was always drunk. I'd go to the tattoo parlor and they wouldn't let me do it because I was drunk. I used to be a drunkard, yes. I used to be a fornicator, I used to be a potty mouth, I used to watch pornography. I don't do those things anymore, but I used to be those things. I'm trying to communicate to you and everybody else here. You just stop doing those things and trust in Christ. He's willing to forgive you. He, Christ died for the ungodly. That's, that's the way I was, and that's the way many of you are now. Christ died for the ungodly. But tattoos, young man, getting back to that, aren't necessarily sinful, depending on why you're getting it, what's your purpose. Well, I want people to look at me and think I'm cool. Then, yeah, you're being selfish and sinful. Some people, out of ignorance, when they're new Christians, will get a cross put on their shoulder. I don't think it's necessarily sinful, but I wouldn't recommend it. And, uh, and, and the Old Testament is talking about worshiping pagan idols. That's why they're marking their bodies. Now, if you're marking your body for that reason, of course it's sinful. But not everyone who gets a tattoo is doing it for that reason. As many people who I know who've gotten lost, I mean, tattoos all up and down their arms, but now they're Christians. They can't get them removed. They can't afford to get them removed. They're not sinners. They repented of it. But God's merciful towards sinners. Merciful towards the ungodly. Merciful towards the fornicator. I know because I used to be those things. It's filthy. At 19, I was worse than many of you will I probably ever become. Yes, you, particularly, yes, you are a bad young man. Yes. I've heard the filthy words come out of your mouth, young man. You are wicked. Now, I can't say that about everybody here because I don't know everybody. Well, you don't know me, period. I know it's come out of your mouth, young man. I know it's coming out of your mouth, too. The Word of God. Shit, What's the Word of God from your point of view. Young man, I don't think you're even qualified to talk about the Word of God. That kind of okay. filthy language come out of your mouth. What's that? That's fine. That's see, see, this is the way sinners settle things. They want to fight over them. They want to be lifted up and be prideful. I'm going to beat you up and beat you down. I'm not interested in fighting anybody here. Yes, I'm giving you words. I'm giving you the gospel, the message that can save your soul, and you reject it and give me filthy words back and threaten to beat me up and threaten to fight me. I'm not going anywhere else, young man. You don't own this place. I didn't say I did. But I'm not telling anyone to leave. Yes, I am here to tell you what to believe. That's right. But you don't have to believe it. Um, I'm not forcing you to believe it, young man. But I am going to tell you what to believe. Because what the Bible says... I believe it's true, and the Bible tells me to tell you what to believe. I proclaim God's word. If you don't like that, you're, you're welcome to walk away. But God commands you to repent. God commands you to give up your sin. And I am here to tell you how to believe. I am here to judge you. I'm here to warn you of God's judgment. I'm here to preach to you the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news that you might be saved. But it's your choice. You have free will. You have free will. You can choose to follow Christ and obey Him and give up your sin. Or you can stay a sinner and go to hell. Those are your choices. I can't make you choose. God won't make you choose to follow Him. But He gives you the option. I'm here to influence you to the best of my ability. To take the right option. But in the end, it's all your choice. In the end, you have a choice to make. In the end, you have to choose to follow Christ or not. Not me. I don't choose for you. I don't even choose for my son or my own children. They choose for themselves whether they're going to follow Christ or not. I, I really hope you will follow Christ. That's my prayer for you. That's my plea towards you. That's the whole reason I'm here. Think about it. I use my money, my time. I could be at home working and making money right now. Instead, I come out here and preach the gospel to you. Endure your filthy language towards me and your cussing towards me and your hatred towards me. Endure it for your sake. For your sake.
Not for my second, nothing out of this. Nothing. The only one that could potentially get anything out of this is you. Say it again, young man. Young man, the Bible says in Psalm 1 1, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. No offense, young man, but I'm not going to take any counsel from you. If I did, I wouldn't be blessed in God's eyes. That doesn't mean anything. Going to a building you call church does not save you, does not make you a Christian. And I forgive you of your sins. There's many people who go to church Sunday, Wednesday, maybe even twice on Sunday and twice on Wednesday. They're still going to hell. Well, you had a cigarette in your hand a second ago. I've been hearing what you've been saying, the things you've been saying. And so what comes out of your mouth reveals your heart, the Bible says. Well, I don't remember exactly what you said, but I've... I've Notice the overall tone of you has been as mockery and against what I'm saying. Are you for what I'm saying or against what I'm saying? I'm not saying I'm for anything. Okay, well, Jesus said you're either for me or you're against me. You either scatter with me or you're, or you're gather with me or you're scatter abroad. You've got to pick a side, young man. You're either with Christ or you're against him. There's no third side. Oh, well, my tone... And my, the focus of what I talk about and how I carry it out is determined by the crowd. If I had a bunch of people here who were humble of heart, uh, they were meek, they were quiet, they realized they were sinners deserving of hellfire, I would talk about the grace and mercy of God and the cross of Christ probably more than anything else. Okay? But when I, but when I hear people lifting up in their hearts their sin cheering for sin, mocking the gospel, blaspheming God's name, filthy words that come out of the mouth, threats of violence towards the preacher. I want to preach on hell, judgment, and sin more than anything. It doesn't work. It just makes well, it you say it doesn't work, but the Bible says it does work. And I'm going to believe the Bible over you. The Bible says that God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. I haven't found very many humble people here today, unfortunately. Well, that's part of the problem. Because people who are prideful are sinners. And pride goes before the destruction. But God opposes the proud. He resists. He's against the proud. So if this whole college, like you're saying, is prideful, God's against his whole college. But he's for, he gives grace to the humble. The sacrifice of God or a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. Wait a minute. Now, just because I'm preaching loudly or preaching with a, a certain tone, certain tone, does not mean I'm not being humble. Where are you getting your definition of humble from? Humble is not considering yourself more highly than you ought to. I don't do that. I have confidence in God's word. I know it's true. I'm going to declare it emphatically. And if sinners are cheering for the sin, I'm going to confront them in their sin and call them to repentance. Exactly what you see the prophets doing in the Old Testament. Exactly what John the Baptist does, what Jesus does, and what the apostles do. And I'm going to do what they do. Not what someone else wants me to do, but what they want me to do. 2 Timothy 4, 2 says, Preach the word in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Proverbs 27, 5 says, Open rebuke is better than love carefully concealed. Ephesians 5, 11 says, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Jesus said in Revelation 3.19, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Such thing as tough loving, man. And most people here, I'm willing to say, need tough love. Yes. They've been pampered in their sin all their life. That's why they're continuing in it. You need to realize how serious sin is. How serious eternity is, how serious hell is, how serious it is that Christ died on the cross for you. It's basic instinct for you. No, it isn't. It's in our blood. No, it is not. There's no sin in the blood. Sin is a choice. It is in the Sin's not a thing. We're built to do wrong. No, we're not. We're built to do right. You're made in God's image. You're not made for sin. God condemns sin. God's against sin. God's against sinners of hell. How can you be made for it? 
I agree you have a choice to make, but God didn't make you to be a sinner. God made you to be holy. God made you to be like Him. God made us to want to be like Him. No, to be like Him. 1 Peter 1.14 says, As obedient children, not conforming yourself to your former lusts, as in your ignorance, but as He who called you is holy, so you also be holy in all your conduct. For it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. That's the Word of God. God wants you to be holy. That's God. That's a God-given conscience you God's put in you. First of all, I agree with you that everyone has a conscience, and they know right from wrong. Listen, listen. I agree with you that God, you have a God-given conscience, and the Bible says in Romans two that your conscience accuses you when you do wrong, and excuses you when you do right. Okay, but. The Bible also, the people have seared and corrupted and defiled their consciences. Okay? So, in other words, it's kind of like an alarm clock. You got an alarm clock at home. You put it on a, an alarm at 7 o'clock in the morning. I don't know how your alarm works, but mine, if you hit the snooze bar too many times, it stops coming on. Okay? That's kind of the way your conscience works. You keep saying, it tells you not to lie, you lie. Don't lie, lie. Don't lie, lie. After a while, you don't hear it anymore. Exactly. My point is, people have seared and corrupted their conscience, defiled their conscience to the point where they don't hear it anymore. And I'm here, take the sword of the Spirit, which the Bible is called, pierce their heart, pierce their conscience, go through the outer overlaying of cross, get into the tender part again, and get their conscience, which within them, to agree with God's Word, which it's supposed to do. But concerning why I come here to preach, one, for the glory of God, because He commands me to, and I'm one of His servants, and I want to obey Him. Two, for the salvation of sinners. Because I love them and I want them to be in the kingdom of God. I don't want them to go to hell. I have pity for them. I used to be the same way as most of the people who I've encountered today. I used to be the same way as a lot of them. So I have pity for them. So those are the two main reasons I come here. One, for the glory of God. I want to obey Him. And two, I love sinners and want them to be saved. Which one? What, 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 how much of what have I accomplished? How many people have you saved? Well, I never said I could save anybody. Okay? I what said... Trying to do? No, I'm preaching the message that if they choose to believe in it, they will be saved. You're acting as if I have power people to make them get saved. If I did, everyone here would be saved. But I don't have that power. And so, whether people get saved or not, does not determine how effective I am. Whether I'm doing everything before God, I should be doing. So that determines. Yourself, not for everyone else. No, that's not what I say. You're not listening to me. I'm doing it for God. You know, God told Ezekiel, He said, go preach to the people, but none of them are going to listen. According to you, you shouldn't go preach. I'm telling you, I preach because God tells me to. Whether anyone gets saved or not. I want everyone to be saved, and so does God. But you have a free will. I can't force you, no matter how good a preacher I am, I could never force you to be saved. Jesus, the greatest preacher ever known to man. Most people rejected him. The whole world hated him, according to John 7, 7, in Jesus' own words. Even his own disciples, when he was rested in the garden, fled from him. His top disciples denied him three times. The way people respond to a message is not reflective upon the um, effectiveness of the preacher, or how good a preacher he is. How good a preacher is and the effectiveness of the preacher is based upon how well he obeys God's word and obeys what God calls him to do. And that's what I do. I preach the whole counsel of God to as many people as I can. And then they have a choice to make. They can obey God and follow him and follow Christ or they can keep being a sinner. That's their choice. Psalm 1 1. Blessed is a man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Okay, I don't take advice from people who aren't Christians living for Jesus Christ. Well, we're finishing up for the day. Does anyone have any last questions before I leave?
That's none of your business. Why are you videotaping me? I want to. You're at dinner. You're at the table. Anyone else? Okay. My mail, okay.